So thank you so much to um, Anubhav and Devyani at Ojas Gallery for this opportunity. I was thrilled to be invited to um, curate and organize the show of Santosh Kumar Das and also to write um, a catalog essay, which I enjoyed immersing myself in his work. And we, um, I f first encountered his work uh, in New York back in 2006 during the Edge of Desire exhibition. And so um, it seemed to be, again, a wonderful reunion to come back and be able to have this opportunity to work with the show and work with Santosh again. Um, why, after working so often within a contained page, which you compose so brilliantly, you have such a sensitivity to the edges of the page, and particularly the centers, where oftentimes you compose so something, there's a synergy in the middle, or a vortex. Um, and then this kind of uh, composition is so dramatically different. And if it were me as an artist, I would probably like do a million little practice studies, but you just did it. And I think that kind of um, also exemplifies the kind of courage you have, that you don't sketch things out first, that you really just start with the line and carry it from that, which requires a lot of confidence, but a lot of openness to accident and change and to letting the piece kind of go where it needs to go. That was a very long question. Uh, and so I guess to, in a nutshell, I'm curious about what challenges this kind of compositional and narrative structure Posed for you as opposed to the way most of the work is uh, composed in terms of individual frames where the piece is contained within those frames. Um, what, and what did it offer you? Why were you inspired to, to, to change direction in this piece um, that's so different than the way that you work with the other pieces? Yes, uh, Ganga Devi was my inspiration and I have seen her life cycle. Mm -hmm. So I always wanted to do something like that. I thought I too should do a very large uh, scroll and uh, paint a narrative. So since then I have been nurturing this idea and which was a big challenge and very difficult to paint like that. So in uh, 1999, I was just discussing this with my nephew. Would I be able to do a scroll? Should I do a scroll? And I was very much excited, very optimistic, full of energy that I should take up this challenge. And that's how this happened. And the story I chose because I knew many stories from my mother. So this is a beautiful story and, and it offers Shakespearean nature. So this story uh, impressed me a lot. So I thought I should do uh, this, uh, I can say, story. So it was, a, uh, and then this, uh, this idea of uh, doing a scroll uh, was, I, I think, inspired by the life cycle. So I always had a question, if you paint in the line style, and if you don't paint like a master like Ganga Devi, then you are, you are not doing anything. I love her. I wanted to be like her. So these two scrolls are the example of my first attempt at being doing something like her. That's how it happened to me. Um, which, which piece came first? This came first. <coughs> this one came first, and then this happened later. Mm -hmm. And how are you, because the, the myth is very um, long and involved, and uh, your nephew Shantanu was kind enough to send me a, a narrative of that too, and so one is tempted then to sort of look at the na uh, narrative and sort of pick out parts of the story, and then I notice there are other things, like the, the spider, which uh, for an arachnophobe like me was a bit startling. Um, th that doesn't appear in the story, so obviously there are things that you're inventing and taking off from, and that again seems typical of your work, that you have a departure point, which is the story, and then it becomes yours. And that's true whether it's Krishna or whether you're dealing with um, mythological subjects that many artists have dealt with, or your observations of daily life, that you somehow santoshize the works and they become your own. And um, so. Are there any sort of examples in some of these pieces too where you were kind of creating a, a new story out of this old story? Um, when where do you feel like it's okay to do that and where you have to kind of be faithful to the imagery um, or the story? There are, <coughs> there are many stories, but uh, I just began with this story because this is the story uh, which, is, which uh, is a kind of, uh, I can say, truth, uh, uh, in mostly in the lives of kings, uh, kings I think, there, are, there is a wicked minister or there is a wicked queen mm -hmm. who wants to kill the, you know, the, the life of the, the kill the uh, princess, young princess, 
and I have seen this story in films as well. So it appealed to me in that, in that wiki. I should do this story. It's you, it, you, the universal nature of it? Of the story. Right. It appealed to me a lot. So I thought I must start off with this story. Mm -hmm. I have to kind of, again, um, I think uh, um, I'm always kind of uh, riveted in your work by a lot of the compositional strategies that you use. And I call, I describe in my essay that your work is kind of poles of excess and restraint, um, sort of uh, intention and intuition. And I was just sort of curious when you're trying to orchestrate such a large piece like this that could very easily become totally chaotic in which the viewer doesn't even want to deal with it. They're pushed away from that as opposed to being engaged with it. That takes such incredible command and knowledge of compositional strategies, figure ground, even the size of the marks against each other because they create value relationships, and, um, and pacing and rhythm. And yet, um, you, it's all inside of you because it sort of, again, it sort of comes out in a more intuitive way, almost like a jazz riff you know, between yourself that you start with one piece and something else suggests something else. But where do you, where do you, how do you kind of make decisions like this area here, which is one of my favorite, but just because of the way the white space moves around that is part of what makes it so powerful, you know, compared to other areas which are more densely patterned and marked. I mean, is that, is there, how do you make those kinds of decisions or is it sort of thing that just, it happens, you're not, you're not sure why it happens, but. There are two things which play an important role in deciding these things. One is restraint and the other is, uh, I can say, uh, the other is uh, lyricality mm -hmm. and then, and clarity. So I just think of an idea mm -hmm. in terms of these things. And as they begin to appear clearer and clearer, I just start to paint. Mm -hmm. And then I think of, uh, you know, of anything very naturally. So for what is stri strikes me first, I begin with that. And then very naturally I proceed further and further. And things keep, you know, just revealing themselves. It's very natural. To me, art is very natural. I think. I think it's very natural for me, the way I speak so simply, in the same way I paint very simply. So I think it's this uh, element of, I can say, you know, uh, I think, I mean, it just, uh, I feel like if you know the essence of the medium, very deeply, very truly like a musician, then you can, you can deal with a raga whichever way you do. So I listen to classical music a lot, a lot, so I deal, with everything like a song, like a raga. So that's why these, uh, I can say, elements which play an important role to a, to a writer, to an academic, or to a critic, I mean, uh, don't act in the same way to me when I start off. To me, it's very natural. You just know a thing very deeply, very truly. And then things, I think, guide themselves. It's very natural to me. It's not. I mean, it's not difficult for me because I'm so excited all the time. And in, inside my mind, I all the time practice a song. Even no, now I'm singing a song, not externally, in my mind. So I derive lots of clarity, lots of insights, lots of intuition from, from music. And I apply them while I paint such a scroll or whatever. Even I do a, a sketch, my line is very, uh, you know, very animated, very lively, full of vitality. So that's what I was say, saying there. These are the things I was saying with Avisek just, I don't know, a day ago. You have to die to become an artist. Die means not physically, metaphorically. Your elements, your mind, I must die slowly and slowly. So you become a very good sadhak, very good, I can say, practitioner of a particular faith, a particular philosophy. In the same way, I have practiced art. And Ganga Devi was a rare person. Many people don't know that. If you, if you sit with her for four hours, she will just ask one question to you. Imagine, I love this restraint. And, the other, and so this restraint, restraint, I admire a lot. And as a seeker, you must earn that. So in my life, I always live, I'm, I'm always surrounded by solitude most of the time. For nine hours, 10 hours, I don't speak. I don't feel that I should speak. I always feel when I go out and I saw people speaking so much, I feel I don't know, are they crazy or are they the best human being? I'm sorry, all of us are the best human being. But I feel I'm very beautiful because I want to speak less and I want to paint more. Like Picasso, his power lies in the images. To me, 
I don't know more, but my images are very strong, wonderful images. So I want to speak through images, not through words. So initially, everything I, I cannot say or explain as clearly as you may expect from me, but I definitely know what I am doing and how things get, you know, I, I mean, uh, determined during the course of a work like this. It was, it was a very ambitious work for me because I was then just working as an English teacher, family, for some money. And I kept telling my nephew, I, want, I can paint like Ganga Devi. He said, no, it's a big challenge, don't say that. But when I did these two scrolls, yes, I was on cloud, cloud nine. I did something like Ganga Devi. If anyone who has seen the line style in the 70s, it is a throwback painting for those people. You can go back into the 70s. This is, there is a feeling of time, there is a feeling of, you know, the storytelling and then the quality of line, which is very old, very archaic. You can't see this, this sort of lines nowadays. And I wanted to earn this, this kind of, you know, purity of the line, purity of the medium. So that's how I paint. So it's a different story because honestly, I neither think much, no, I don't think much, I don't think I think much and I remain quiet most of the time. Well, I love food, I'm a big foodie. <laughs> and then I love music. Of course, I love movie actors and actresses a lot. <laughs> Still, I love them. And then I love music, and then I love painting. So my world is very small. I don't know many people, there are three, four people. They're beautiful people, and they help me see beauty in everything, because I love to see beauty in everything. Because to me, in life, I mean, you know, in your life you do all sorts of things, all sorts of ups and downs, squirrels, disputes, everything. But I don't think there is any beauty in it. But when I watch a movie, and there is a similar situation, because this is presented through the eyes of an artist, through the eyes of a director, there's lots of beauty. And this I have been, you know, enjoying, releasing, or rather nurturing inside me from my childhood. So I have a different, you know, different eye to everything. To me, if I don't see beauty and you, then I'm sorry, you are very insignificant to me. I may not like to speak to you. But if I see even an iota of beauty in you, I'll go up to you and say, oh, you are a beautiful girl, you are a beautiful lady. Well, your dress is beautiful. I love this sort of life. And I love this approach to life because to me, everything is very transitory. Life is very transitory. And if you don't seek beauty in your life, then I don't know what kind of person you are. You can better judge yourself. But I know beauty. And then the, my other muse is Buddha. So he is, I mean, he's so silent. I have never seen anybody. So whenever I look at his statue, I really get, you know, besotted, mesmerized by his silence. So I always ask my nephew, why this man is so relaxed? He said he has nothing to prove. No identity, nothing. No, no recognition, nothing. He is just an elegant beggar. Yes, he begs for arms, nothing else. I love this simplicity. And I practice that in my life also. Very seriously, I practice. I feel only then you can live a very good life if you have to do a few things in life, like I paint, and like I sing, I have nothing to do. For other things, I depend on Anwar and other people's of his ill. You write about me, you can even do my, you, you can do the talking on my behalf. I will sit behind you, you do the talking for me. That would be a privilege for me. Because I don't want to be heard more, I want to be seen more. And my paintings, my lines will tell you everything about me. You, you just have to develop the eye. You just have to know my guru. So it's like, uh, you know, it's like paying a tribute to the guru. That's why I did these two scrolls. That's quite an answer, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, this is what I feel. This is what I honestly feel all the time. Even since I met Anwar, I say these things to him to all the time. So he listens very patiently, and then he goes off, OK, I have to do this. So this is beautiful. This is a beautiful relationship. And, this, and the same kind of freedom, if I find in other, place, other places and, in, and with other people, I begin to love that person. So whenever I come to this gallery, I enjoy sitting in that glass kiosk mm -hmm. and reading books and then doing some, some drawings and then going through catalogs and everything. So it's a wonderful, you know, you just pa pass your time very nicely, very harmoniously. So this is, and, and these things really, you know, grow inside you. It, I mean, people are not that aware. It's just a matter of awareness of your essence as a person, of your real essence. 
once you encounter that and, and, and keep watering that, you become, I mean, you become a transformed person. You are not what you were. You change a lot. You change. So I always look at my photograph from the 70s, and now I look at the same photograph. And, and another photograph of this time, I feel I'm, I'm, I'm not that in this photograph. I'm a changed man. I'm changing so faster. So these are the things which guide my in my art. So to me, there is no difference between my art and my painting. I'm, I mean, art and my life. So I feel, you know what I say to, uh, say to myself, about myself, even if I don't paint, I'm an artist. You just look at me. You can take pictures of me. They will be wonderful pictures, like my painting, because I have become art, honestly. I have a question. Yes. OK. Yes. Um, you, had, you talked about, again, uh, Ganga Devi as a muse in terms of her, you be, described being besotted by her refined yes, yes, yes. Um, line. And, um, but also with Ganga Devi, that once she started to achieve a certain amount of recognition, she was traveling a lot. And so then she, and Jotinder Jain writes about this wonderfully in his book, that there are certain artists in the, in the tradition that it, it was about these traditional themes and anything outside of that really was meaningless. But an artist like Ganga Devi was able to absorb as she took trains, as she took planes. I love the series when she was in Washington, D.C. and she said all of the men are carrying the shopping bags and not the women. Her just witty observations and then the very sad series about her having cancer in the end, but also just watching the ceiling fan, these little details. And so her work really kind of expanded, not ex it went from traditional work through incorporating her life experiences and back. And I feel like with you that's also happened because you talk about this, uh, this uh, um, time in Baroda and how that you felt that the contemporary art scene, it wasn't something that you could really connect with, but the life itself and the conviviality, the camaraderie, encountering all the artists there, Gula Muhammad Sheikh, Manjit Bawa, how that kind of um, developed you and enlarged your kind of sense of life. And so, um, it, but it said, when you said you, when you came back to Madhubani, you couldn't make that kind of work. And so you had to find your, and, but you felt like you couldn't make work that was confined by the tradition anymore. But so you had to kind of invent your own style out of that. Um, and so that takes a certain amount of um, thought in terms of how you're going to do that. Because every artist wants to sort of be unique in some way, to kind of make their mark on something. So how do you feel like you sort of were able to kind of go away from home and come back home? Because um, you, you moved, you have a, a great diversity of subjects. Everything from, again, the, light, the delights of daily life to the Krishna theme that you return to again and again. Um, you never sort of leave that behind. But how did the time in kind of Baroda and, and tra other travels you've taken, you've been spending time in Bombay, I mean, how do you bring that into your work in a way that makes sense for you? Yes, let me tell you a few things which I have experienced recently. Since 2002, uh, 2016, when I won this Ojas Award, I have been traveling a lot. So I have been uh, flying a lot, and Ojas is very generously funding my flights, and I enjoy flights, honestly. I was at the airport just a few days ago, and I was thinking, doing a po painting with myself at the airport and Buddha at the, at the same place. Really? So it's a wonderful, so I was thanking Anubhav. If Anubhav keeps funding my flights a lot, you will have beautiful paintings. I want to see that. You and Buddha. Yes, yes you I want to do that. Going through x-ray together? Yes, and, and Buddha uh, at the airport. Because, you know, I love everything which is very huge, which is very full. I think even as a human being, you have to be very generous because you allow yourself to open up to all those forces which work through you in a way that you become gradually very, you know, you assimilate, begin to assimilate a lot of things. That make you a very full person, very strong human being. So I love airports a lot. I wish uh, someday some government will allow me to stay there for a day. I can do wonderful sketches. Even in this visit, I was just thanking him a lot because I was at Terminal 1 in Mumbai. And I was just sharing this with my nephew. Look, it's a beautiful place. I love a huge, I mean, a giant place. And air, uh, uh, I think and, uh, air, uh, airport is a very giant place. In a way, I feel I am a giant artist, very big artist. I mean, in not in a sense like, uh, I mean, and because of any ego, no. In a sense like, I just want to expand a lot. I want to incorporate a lot of things into my art to make this art really a wonderful expression, a fuller expression. So a place like airport 
you see all kinds of you know humanity all kinds of people i mean definitely a different set of people you see which you cannot see at the railway station generally so i i love that crowd very much and then then every minute you see a a plane taking off which is a beautiful sight and you know <coughs> at the ojas i saw the the shadow of the plane on the ground just on the grass just swimming as if a big fish is swimming in a swimming pool it's a beautiful idea so it's a big place so that way you 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 imbibe this 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 strength from a place from from the spirit of the that hugeness so that's why i'm saying if you uh, travel a lot i mean uh, the way you like you grow a lot so so this is how even uh, ganga devi who traveled to united states england or i think paris everywhere she has been to and that's how her painting her themes changed and her themes became contemporary so this is how i can say you learn things from traveling which is very important but it's also the challenge um, of how to represent that because you're you're working with a, a flat space, which for me as an artist, I'm a realist artist, no so it's, it's almost uh, easier for me to make something three dimensional. It's more it would be much more of a challenge to translate that through the medium that you're doing. And um, I just want to talk about that in reference to uh, one series that we have a lot of images of, which is really fortunate that we have so many images of the Krishna series because. When you look at those side by side of Krishna with the flute, of Krishna and Radha, of Krishna with the snake demon Kaliya, um, it allows you to kind of look at the, the versatile approaches that you take. And so I had just had a question just a bit because there are the um, amazing images of Krishna and Kaliya, which I described in my essays almost close to being psychedelic um, or like a crazy quilt in terms of the intense amount of detail and pattern and color that are kind of sometimes clashing with each other. And then across the room, we have these incredibly iconic, somber, quiet pieces, and I'm just sort of curious within a particular theme, is this, um, is, is it about synesthesia, the idea of different senses coming together at one point, and so that the mark making represents sound, and the sound might be different in the pieces that are very minimal, as opposed to the pieces that are very complex, visually complex and busy, or how do you kind of conceive of these pieces? Um, is it time for noise and then time for quietness, or are they formal decisions, or? Um. No, there are no formal decisions, but it's a different process. If I choose an idea, like if I wanted to paint Krishna, so uh, it's like I just uh, started uh, his head, his just figure, the Krishna figure, and then I wanted to take all my time. I'm not in a hurry. So it takes me, you know, maybe seven days, ten days, nine days to do a painting. And then during that time, a lot of things, you know, keep keep flashing in my mind, keep appearing in my mind. Well, I am very, very sensitive to them. And then I capture a lot of things, which, which I can say, you know, which can, which they go to different, different things uh, just during that, during that period, during that time, which I even, I did not know before. So this uh, makes my work very different and charged with different, different, I can say, ideas or perspectives. And I am like that. If I stand next to you, I begin to feel a lot about you. I may not say that to you. I mean, there's no need, but I feel the vibes of that person easily, very easily. So if, when I just color or start the work, I feel in the same way. So that's why those things get reflected into my art. I mean, then that leads to these questions. So when I, I mean, I think I live, I live myself very deeply, very deeply, like, like when I sing or when I listen to Vims and Joshi. It's a wonderful, I can say, you know, it's a wonderful time for me, like two hours or 30 minutes or 50 minutes if I listen to a song. I love that time. And, you know, and then I, I try to live it up again when I sketch or paint or, or I can do some doodles. So it's a different thing because I think, uh, what uh, impresses you most or interests you most, most matters a lot. So to me, uh, now, like uh, in, uh, in, in case of Krishna series, it is a different experience. It's a very much like, uh, like an encounter with, my, with myself. Because when I started the series, I just did the head and I was just uh, sitting very calmly on the chair. And suddenly I, I begin to see, I feel I don't exist for almost half an hour or for almost 
more than half an hour. Then I again came out of, out of that, you know, that realm or that stupor or that trance. And I feel more energized and I feel that some force is guiding me, telling me go ahead and do this. And this became the process. So the entire Krishna series is a different experience. As if somebody is some force inside me is guiding me. I don't even know that force before this experience. Or nor, nor can I speak, speak more about it. But there is something happened to me during the Krishna series. And then I feel that I became more, you know, more tuneful. I became, I mean, the element of tunefulness started work through me very, very clearly and deeply. And then, you know, doing a work of art or anything became much easier and beautiful experience. I mean, I don't, I don't feel intimidated by, intimidated by challenges. It's beautiful to be challenged. It's no, there are no challenges for me. No, nothing. Honestly, I don't feel challenged. Just nowadays, I feel if, like I'm doing Lover series now. Since in 2017, I'm doing a series of paintings on Lovers, mm -hmm. um, Lover series. It's beautiful. I just did one painting uh, in one month, just last year. Mm -hmm. I just did four, month, four paintings in four months. But I enjoyed it a lot because I was just, you know, just freezing into a state of silence where I did not want to even speak. And I live with my niece, so I feel I have gone there to become a Buddha, not a painter. Because with her, I don't want to speak more. I want to imbibe her uh, calmness more because she's very much like me. She's not a person of words. And if I sit with my nephew, then I'm a wonderful person, then I would love to listen to him, then we talk a lot, and then a lot of things transpire between us. Then I feel, I feel I'm, I'm, I become mad then. Then I feel I should do this, I should do that. So it's a different, you know, it's a different relationship. So a, a relationship also changes from person to person. Like what I feel uh, about you or with you, I may not feel exactly the same with another person. And I am very much aware of these things of life. And they guide me very much, very much, both artistically and spiritually. So my art is very much soaked into meditation, spirituality. So all the other factors, which could be intellectual, artistic, pedagogic, anything, which could be anything, they do re keep revealing to me during that process. And which I share with my nephew. So it's a different experience. Different. I love the one that you're describing, the, the mirrored image too, which is, has this almost this incredible um, decorative surface throughout that you said that that was about um, you and your nephew in terms of reflection or something. It was a really nice explanation you just gave to me today because part of the enjoyment of writing the essay was that it was a creative act for me. I knew that I didn't want to have to contact you about every piece and find out what it was about because I, I knew I, I suspected that you were probably open to different people's interpretation in terms of how they read and see the work. Um, it's, I think it's actually going to come up on the screen right after that as well. But the um, that was mesmerized by that piece because of the com complex amount of things that you were holding together, the amount of color, the amount of shape, but also that sense of symmetry and asymmetry. That was the piece I was talking about. That but you had described it really nicely as that it was about you and Shantanu or yes. different. Yeah. Because I work with him most of the time. Uh -huh. I discuss everything with him. Because he makes things very simpler and easier for me. And, and so I he have, helps clarify and, and he, he you discuss everything. your ideas with him. Yes. And, and then, how wonderful uh, to have then, that. And then I perceive it the way I want. And then I incorporate it into my art. So, so my art becomes very loaded because it has inputs from another person. And I love to work like that. I want to live even a life like that. Like I just want to do my part. And other, for other parts, I can trust others. Very, I mean, completely, because I don't have questions, and nor would I ever argue about anything. I don't believe in arguing. I mean, I cannot argue about anything. Whatever you say about this mortal could be a, your judgment. I have nothing to do with it. So I love other people, like your questions I love. Maybe I will sit back and think, well, I can derive a lot of things from your questions as well, because the questions are coming from a different mindset and a different, I can say, life and a different background. And I have lived a life in a completely different background. So I have never faced these questions. A life which has no question. Yes, life which is only
trying hard to see where I mean beauty in everything. This is what my life has been till now. So if you work with a person who is uh, very much perceptive or very much I can say you know verbal and can uh, intellectualize or interpret things or imagine things many ways, I love those people and uh, maybe I love writers. I mean I don't write at all but I love writers because you get so many things uh, may not happen in your life but through others life you enrich yourself you you imbibe a lot so that's why you need the uh, you know you need literature music art writing comedy everything so this is how i work we work together but i do uh, you know i i do feel very i can say uh, and, uh, active at times i do feel that uh, a lot of things which you are asking me but just during, uh, during the making of our work. Once the work is over, I think everything is wiped out. And again, just a simple man, it's very difficult. I mean, to me, it's a difficult because I always feel you just, uh, just sit back and be calm and be, uh, try to be calmer and calmer. You are the healthiest man and you can imagine, imagine anything, anything. Once your mind is very much clear and settled, you can imagine anything. And I, I don't know, uh, even I read the uh, interviews of others, <coughs> other people, I don't know, I understand much from them. I don't take anything from those interviews. So to me, uh, I only can understand books on musicians. I can, uh, books on musicians, or maybe I love Picasso very much. He is my muse. Or I'm a Fusen, I love it a lot. I can derive a lot of strength from these guys. But I don't think other people interest me a lot. I'm not saying they are bad, but they don't interest me more. I love people, those who have, you know, the frenzy, the passion to do anything they want to do. I love such people, crazy people. I think what we're going to do now is, um, I'm sure people are dying to ask you a few questions. I, I was intrigued by what you're saying and what you're doing. Because you said, I don't have to speak, my art speak for me, and I can relate to that as an artist. And that's a wonderful uh, testimony to share with other artists and with other people. Now, I know nothing about your iconography. I know nothing about uh, the mythology that creates. But what really intrigued me a lot is the many layers of your work. Uh, at a pure aesthetic level, is fascinating. I mean, what you're doing with the line, with pattern, with rhythm, with flow is absolutely stunning visually. But I am still intrigued by the other layer which I cannot penetrate, which is the meaning of the iconography. Uh, the, my first question is how important for you as the artist to have your viewers, especially someone like me from a Western tradition, to really understand the narrative because a piece like that, more so than the individual pieces, the narrative is extremely important. So how important it is for you as an artist to really understand the narrative. The second question, which is even more important for me, as I was gazing there, I saw the series that you did about the Gujarat uh, violence. And I absolutely am fascinated about an art that is inspired by something that happened in your lifetime. But as I was looking, I was in a way, um, Yes, fascinated by the idea that you are treating it with the same beauty. I did not see violence in it. I didn't see uh, sadness in it. I didn't see anger in it. The statements that accompanied the images were very powerful. You're talking about the number of people that died. You're condemning the political system that really uh, encouraged that violence. You spoke about how uh, the governor became the prime minister. But the painting itself was saying something different. Can you please talk a little bit about that? Um, okay, <coughs> I can say a few things about your questions. Maybe I may, I may not have understood them properly, but I, I, I may still manage to say a few things. The first thing, uh, the first thing I would say about the element of iconography. Once the medium, the medium in which you paint, or uh, is very refined, very deep. Everything you do is loaded with iconography. Only then you become iconic. That means your elements, your character, integrate with each other. They become one. So once you merge with yourself, then you attain that, that, that level of, you know, icon iconic. You become iconic. So there's lots of iconography. So this is the same element I have discovered in Ganga Devi. 
everything she did or she has done is dipped, I think is dipped in iconography, a bird, an object, an everyday object from life, everything. So it's just like uh, you have to master or internalize the medium. Unless you internalize the medium, you may not know the purity of that medium. You may not know the, I can say, you know, austerity of the medium. You may know a medium differently. Like if you know a medium as a technique, or then you can handle it very clearly, I mean cleverly or intelligently, but that's, then it may not have this thing, uh, uh, iconography. But once your medium is the, I can say, is, the, uh, is a very much charged with this purity, is highly iconic. Then everything you do, or your awareness of the medium leads to, to you know, to follow this element I iconography very carefully in everything you do. It is there. You don't do it. It is just there. You just follow the line, the, the vitality of the line. It's a highly iconic. So it's like that. And uh, about the Gujarat series, actually, uh, you know, it's, this, it's a very sad thing, I think. It's a very sad thing. So I did not want to do that series, but when I did this, and after uh, studying, uh, I can say going through lots of magazines for four months, it was a very, uh, uh, you know, difficult in a sense that you uh, that I was uh, trying to, I can say, tell a story or tell out something which had just happened. So uh, what I uh, learned from the magazines was like, uh, like just like you know, they are just dividing two communities which I don't like, which nobody will ever like. Just they are dividing two communities and then the, the, the use of, I can say, God uh, in politics is very funny. I don't think it's, a, there are two different things. God is a different phenomenon and politics is an entirely different, different phenomenon. So if you mix with them, you will have then another culture, I think, which can help politicians win elections, I'm sure, mm -hmm. which they are doing. But I don't think, uh, I mean, it's a very, I mean, it gives a bad taste. Like, you know, like you, uh, you know, you use all those uh, sadhus from Ayodhya, then you use all sorts of, then you create those cards. I mean, the free, uh, uh, your own definition of Hinduism, I don't understand. I don't know. I never wanted to know why I'm a Hindu. <laughs> I never asked this question. I find this a very funny question. I think I'm just a human being. And I have to be very careful about what I eat or what I say to people. I mean, this is the most beautiful thing I feel. The question is, what is violence and, and war and killing was treated with the same beauty as a love story? No, it's, uh, I think, uh, look, uh, what I feel honestly is there's lots of violence, violence in everybody's life, everywhere. Even an ordinary person's life, ordinary, person, ordinary person's life, there's lots of violence. There's lots of violence already, uh, lots of violence exists in this world. And these politicians are adding more violence uh, just yeah. to, to uh, I can say, to, uh, I can say, win the chair or to become prime minister or to run the country. I don't know. You can better ask the journalists. They are very intelligent journalists and they can answer your questions very satisfactorily. I don't know. I don't know more because I find it very funny. I mean, I'm not saying uh, Hinduism is bad or anything is bad, but I, th I don't think one should uh, stick to these things. But because in real terms, you don't know, you, how can, like I'm talking to Catherine. I don't think I'm talking to her as a Hindu. No, not at all. Even I'm a, I, you can't be a seeker as a Hindu. If I practice a certain philosophy, there's no, nothing, no input of Hinduism in it. So where am a Hindu? Maybe in the government's register, I'm a Hindu. Mm -hmm. So it's very funny. I mean, in terms of other religions also, you can't be a Christian, no. You're not a Christian. It's funny, it's funny to call yourself a Christian. Well, it's very funny. You are just a human being. You have worked hard uh, to, to become a scholar, to become a professor, to become a globe trotter, whatever, movie star, <laughs> maybe a comedian. But I don't think you deeply know what you are or who you are. Once you know that, I'm sure you will never be. You will never be a Hindu. I'm sure the people who I love are not Hindus. They are not Hindus. They are very modern people, new-minded people. They see everything. They see new things in everything, and I appreciate that. Suppose I talk to you, I can derive something from that talk, which is good. If I don't derive, then I must focus on my work. That will help me. Help me in my life through my work. Everything. 
I think one should not get you know distracted to things for just insignificant goals and these I call them insignificant because you know you keep you make two communities fight then you just use dialogues catchy I can say you know those are very much jargon of words just for boards and I think India itself is a big uh, big big I can say you know play uh, I mean uh, play, playground or a, or I think, uh, I mean, these guys are just making them fight for votes. It's very funny. And people don't know anything about Hinduism. I don't know. I don't know where is Hinduism. Let's take it. Does anybody, uh, Manisha, did you have a question? Yes. Uh, congratulations. Uh, I have four or five questions, actually. But <laughs> because I feel, as a practitioner of this art, and uh, I feel you are a very important uh, link uh, to an art which is totally women's art, which uh, started, uh, may, I mean, the earliest documentation is 60s. And I guess since then you have been associated with this art and the artist. So my first question goes that, uh, how did you meet Ganga Devi? Okay, I met Ganga Devi uh, five, six times. I met Ganga, Ganga Devi from the date when she was very poor. She was married in a, to a very poor husband and she came from a very rich family. And perseverance, restraint are her major assets. She was very perseverance all the time. She may not speak much. She would never speak much. She was very restrained. So she would come to my house with rolls of paintings to, uh, to give them to Mahasundri Devi, who was her childhood friend to sell them and then uh, you are like, uh, because I, I think not many people know here uh, that uh, you know you are linked uh, you are a family member of Mahasundri Devi so yes. maybe so you would, can share uh, yeah. that so she, she would come to Rati to give her paintings to uh, to uh, Mahasundri Devi to sell them so that she can have some money because she thought she, she has the skill so she should make some money from that skill so I saw her and she was very humble lady. She would have her painting rolled in a sari, in an old sari, and would and just wait for her, her friend. And then she would hand it over to her and then go back. Then I met her after she became an artist. And even then she was the same person. And uh, when I saw her uh, life cycle for the first time, I was really mesmerized. I cannot believe a woman, such a simple woman, just a five This was uh, which year? 1988, I guess. I was in Baroda. So Raymond uh, organized a first, uh, uh, I can say, first exhibition in Madhubani. So he thought Madhubani is the place where this art happened. So this, uh, there should be an exhibition there first. So he organized an exhibition and I worked for that exhibition a lot. And then I got to see her large panel for the first time. I cannot believe a human being can do that, do such a work of uh, For everybody's uh, information yes. that uh, uh. Dr. Raymond Owen Lee was, uh, he was an anthropologist and he went, he was one of the first people to uh, uh, sort of, uh, I mean, help uh, the women of uh, Mithana. Yes. And I have one very important question because uh, I think uh, you, you used to uh, escort Raymond everywhere, yes, right? Yes, I worked with, so I work with him. Yeah. I worked for his wife for two years. So I was part of the same, uh, I can say, group, same research team. Raymond was working for a film on Madhubani painters, and his wife was an ethnomusicologist. So she, she knew music. She actually was a classical singer. She knew, uh, she was a Drupad singer. So she came to Mithila to research the uh, songs, the music of that region. Yes. And how did you learn from Ganga Devi? Uh, no, look, it's very much, it's, it's a different, uh, it's very much like, you know, Eklabya who went to Dronacharya to learn the art of archery and he was denied just on the basis of caste. Then he came back to the forest, made a statue of, uh, I can say the same guru and started practicing archery and he became an excellent archer, archer not, not less than Arjuna, there is an evidence in the Mahabharata. So in the same way, I wish she could taught me, but there was no way. Why would she teach me? She is a big, big celebrity, big artist now. But I was really mesmerized by, the, by her lines. 
I always thought it very serious, serious, thought about it very seriously. And in my own way, I did it, but I was too young to reach that level. To reach that level, you definitely need, you know, uh, restraint a lot. You have to discipline yourself. You have to focus on it very seriously like a musician. Like a musician practices, uh, uh, you know, uh, takes a practice very seriously for three, four hours. Even a veteran musician sits in that practice for five, six hours every day. So it's a different association with the medium. The medium starts, uh, the, me, the medium begins to consume you, rather you become the medium. Thank you. I mean medium, sorry. Yeah. So I knew Ganga Devi, uh, I mean from that time, and then I saw her, uh, uh, you know, uh, in uh, Delhi. I saw her in Delhi when, when she was doing this, uh, this painting about her, uh, about her trip to Rajgir, which is on the way to Bodh Gaya. And she explained it very nicely, exactly the way she has done. See, what I have observed from that is, once you become a genuine artist, you become the art, yours. You, be, you yourself become the art. So there is no difference between Ganga Devi as a person and Ganga Devi as an artist. She became that quality herself. She became that thing herself. So she explained everything to Ray uh, for three, four hours, and I was there. She didn't ask anything, no question to me. I was just sitting there, and I love that restraint. I love this power, determination. She was, she was very rich in these two, two powers, like restraint and determination. So, you know, um, I wanted to, you know, I wanted to harness these things, but as a human being, and since I am very much, uh, you know, I, I have a lot of other passions, it's very difficult to, to you know, to concentrate on these things. I mean, um, Thank I'm you. restrained. I, want, I have one more question. <laughs> yes. It's because uh, you have a very interesting uh, journey of uh, Mithila painting, being a... I mean, you went parallel, uh, like, uh, you know, all the women artists from your own uh, aunt, Mahasindri Devi, she was, she's a Padma Shri, and uh, she has a major contribution in the field of uh, Mithila painting. So, uh, maybe we would like to know about uh, your journey, starting from the school, you were teaching, I guess, then you were uh, also escorting Raymond, then you went to Baroda, and then your, uh, how, you know, your, uh, Whole journey, it's very, I find it very interesting. Okay. So I want, today I want to know okay. about Okay, let me tell you a few things like, uh, like uh, I used to draw images from early childhood. I was very passionate about everything. Like I saw the, you know, I saw an image of Krishna, Vishnu, and all these gods and goddesses. I would always say to myself, look, these gods and goddesses are very different looking people. The ambience is different. And the character, the images take you to a different time. These things appeal to me. So I used to draw a lot, a lot, with mistakes. All the time with mistakes, but I would do uninterruptedly. And my father supported me a lot. He would, he would give me money, you know. Yeah, he just give me money to watch Aradhana. He says, go and watch your favorite Rajas Khanna because you love him. So he was a wonderful father. So I, I would never like, you know, any subject, all the, um, like history or I find these are very boring things, very boring. I just love English literature and Hindi. I love these two papers, I mean in those days. So I used to draw a lot. And then by the time I was 10, I had a good control over it. I can, I can draw a person's figure accurately, flawlessly, even at the age of six or seven. So in the 70s when this art happened, my mother and all my aunts started to paint. It was an entirely new ambience for my young man, young man. I saw every woman in each, every house doing, an, doing some kind of art. It really, you know, impressed me a lot. So I thought I should do the same thing. And the other interesting thing was that they, we sold our art. So you received money every day on a regular basis. And, and on every alternate day, you see lots of Westerners, which was a big boost. You can learn English from there. If I wanted to learn English, it was a very, you know, very encouraging that on every, uh, you know, alternate, alternate day, you say people from France, Britain, everywhere. So this ambience continued till 80. Till the things started deteriorating, everything, you know, started to vanish. By the 19, I think 90s, everything was gone. Then I had faced this question, what should I do? I returned from Baroda. 
And I did not uh, learn much from Baroda because I was not prepared at all to understand modern art, though I liked the atmosphere very much. And Ghulam Muhammad Sheikh was a very nice person, very, very nice person, very simple person. For any problem, I can easily, I could easily approach him. I could go and say, sir, my uh, funds from America have not reached. What do I do? Okay, I will extend personal guarantee for, me, for you. You can do that. So it was like that. Then, uh, then I came back to my village and I thought I must do, I must return to my roots because I loved it and I, have, I had a template. That's why I turned to Madhuvani style again. Now with a different per perception, with a different goal and with, with lots of enthusiasm. So this is how I start and by 2000, I think I have done enough, I think a long homework to call myself an artist. So for 10 years, I've never thought of money, no money, never. Just, you know, I did everything I could do to, to earn that level of depth, austerity, and purity of the medium like Ganga Devi for complete 10 years, imagine. So that way I knew, knew what is restraint, what is perseverance, what is humility. And then she was a very simple person. So, and there are lots of similarities, I feel. So I feel I could really I could take her legacy further. So from 2000 onwards, I started with these uh, panels, just with that thing in my mind that I too can paint like her. This is how I, you know, this is how I uh, started this journey. After. Yeah, good evening, thank you very much. That was fascinating and taking on from uh, Manisha's uh, <laughs> response. Well, having been a sort of a observer to the his, this oral history of Madhubani art from the s late 70s, I think we need to rewrite the oral history because uh, many areas have not been uh, really catalogued. Because I remember as early as 70s, Kulkarni and Pupul Jaikar and, and also L.K. Jha, you know, they were the ones really because he came from that village and he, and he and Pupul Jaikar were very uh, good family friends and he told Pupul Ji that this is one art that needs to be revived. And I find that no matter where I go, somehow that part of the oral history is missed out. Uh, so I think, you know, since this gallery is doing fabulous work in this area, you need to have a project on reconstructing the oral history and talk to all of us about it so that it gets recorded. Anyway, that's by the way. Okay, now uh, coming to your beautiful work, you know, um, Madhubani as a place is a great resource for culture, you know, particularly when it comes to the Ramayana and Mahabharata and rituals and music and, you know, the idea of sacred drawings and, uh, uh, you know, tracings on the wall and, you know, almost everything is linked with some form of contemplation, contemplative activity or ritual. So I want to know how much of that has inspired your work. Uh, these things, these cultural elements have inspired me a lot because when I came back from Baroda and I wanted to know this art through, through the culture, I studied everything, everything I taught to myself, everything. Like, look, if there is a marriage, then there are uh, preparations in which women, uh, you know, women spread a sari and then they beautiful, uh, they make beautiful edible things with besan. And I love that. And there is lots of design and iconography in that, in those edible things, which, I mean, which are served to the Bharat party. Then there is Sikhi art, which has intricate patterns, which can be, I can say, you know, refer to the, to the intricate aspects of the line. Then there is terracotta. There is a festival called Sama Chakeba, which uh, I think, uh, which is a very long festival especially played uh, by sisters for their uh, brothers. It's a beautiful festival and it has beautiful songs. I can, I can tell you beautiful songs. So there is terracotta, there is Sikhi, there is Likhwa Parua, I mean the uh, edible things were made for the Bharat party. Then there is, uh, I can say the wall, the wall, <laughs> wall paintings. Then, then, then there are diagrams on the floors. Then they make, uh, you know, cloth, I can say uh, dolls. So there are seven, eight, uh, two, nine elements which play a major role in this art. 
and I have studied everything very categorically. My aunt Mahasundri Devi would draw the aripan, the diagram on the floor, beautifully. Honestly, I have never liked her work on paper. No, she never impressed me on, I mean, on paper. But on the floor, with pitar, with the boiled rice paste, she would do amazing drawings as if, as if somebody is working on a huge canvas. And that, from that, I learned a lot. So I rather taught everything to myself. There was no one by my side. Even by that time, my nephew was very young. But I thought, if you learn the art of a particular culture, particular place, you must learn the culture. So that way, I studied everything for almost 10 years. From then, from after, from, and I, they, they play a very important role in knowing the tradition and those, I can say, elements. Yes, they are very important. And Sikki is <coughs> another art form, Sujni. If you uh, take a look at those at the paintings which I have done in red here, which is very which are on so here, you can then remember Sujini because all the, each line I draw, you know, it, it's just like each uh, uh, I mean each tiny minuses the women do with stitches exactly in the same way I do because when I was sewing them in Bombay, uh, one uh, uh, lady said, yes, I, it reminds me of Sujini. So all these elements from the culture, all these aspects from the culture, I have incorporated into this art because I found them playing an important role in the line style of Ganga Devi. So Ganga Devi's line style is a very holistic cultural expression. It is just not a traditional language. It's a full cultural artistic language. And that's how I have I can say studied, I mean, I have rather taught everything to myself because who, if you want to become a genuine artist, you have to teach everything to yourself. Nobody will teach you. I don't think anybody teaches art to anybody. You teach everything to yourself. I mean, this is how you become an artist. I wish. <laughs> After 34 years of teaching, I wish. <laughs> so thank you again for all of you for coming. Yes, I, I enjoy. I enjoy. I enjoy very much. Thank you, Santoshi. Yes, thank you. We had thank a great you, time. Catherine. Yeah.